In this video I'm going to talk about cell theory. I'm going to first talk about spontaneous generation as the prevailing idea around before cell theory. I'm going to talk about the development and all the different people's work leading up to cell theory. We'll then look at cell theory itself as well as some support for cell theory and technological advancements that have happened since cell theory was published. Firstly, I'll start with spontaneous generation. In the 17th and 18th century, it was generally thought that living things or organisms spontaneously generated out of non-living things. And this kind of made sense for them because if you had, for example, a bag of grain and you left it sitting around for too long, uh, you'd open the grain up and there'd be rats in it. So they, rats have spontaneously generated out of the grain. A similar thing would happen if you left meat sitting around too long, maggots would appear, and in muddy water, frogs and fish and things like that would appear. So it made sense for them that uh, those things just spontaneously generated out of uh, non-living things. And cell theory is later disproved this. The story of cell theory is pretty much the story of the development of microscopes and how microscopes have got better and we've been able to see more things. The first microscope was created by Hans and Zacharias Janssen uh, and they were spectacle makers and they produced uh, a microscope with two lenses and a wooden barrel and this was in 1600. By 1665, this microscope had been further developed and a guy named Robert Hooke was looking at the, you're using his microscope to look at some thin slices of cork. And when he looked at the thin slices of cork, he noticed a honeycomb-like structure. And he looked at it and he thought, well, it reminded him of the cells that monks uh, sleep in their rooms, little tiny boxes. So he decided to call these things that he saw cells. In 1683, Anton van Leeuwenhoek uh, created his own type of microscope, and you can see this microscope here. It had a little uh, pin that you put the specimen on to hold the specimen, and you'd look through the other side through a lens at the specimen. And he did so a few different experiments, but he did some with saliva, he did it with stagnant rainwater, and he saw little tiny unicellular life. And we know now that this is bacteria, but at the time he called them animacules, so microscopic animals. Uh, and he could actually see them floating around and doing things and behaving like animals. Many years later, in 1831, Robert Brown came along and the lenses had got better and better by this stage. And by looking at some plants through a microscope, he was able to see a structure inside the cell, a large structure inside the cell. And he called this the nucleus. Not long after this, Matthias Schleiden and Theodor Schwann uh, came up with the proposal of cell theory. And the original proposal was that cells are small units of life and that all living things are made up of cells. In 1858, uh, another scientist came along and he added that all cells are made from pre-existing cells. And this goes, or this is the part that goes to disprove spontaneous generation. Everything leading up to that time uh, was incorporated in cell theory, as well as all the things that we've covered since. So all the stuff that we've discovered since, looking at uh, the other structures inside cells, have also supported cell theory, which is why we still keep something that's over 200 years old. Uh, some of the big things that support this was Francesco Redi's experiment, in 1668 and Louis Pasteur's experiment in 1862, which both go to prove uh, the invalidity of spontaneous generation. 
1880, Walter Fleming was looking at some cells and described the process of cell division, which we now call mitosis. Fast forward to 1933 and Ernst Ruschka developed the first electron microscope. The electron microscope was one of the biggest uh, advances in the development of the microscope because it meant that we could look at things with far, far more clarity than we did before. And it allowed us the discovery of all the uh, smaller organelles inside the cell. In 1948, Paul Kirkpatrick developed an X-ray microscope, and again, these X-rays are even smaller than electrons, so you can see with even more clarity, and it allowed us to get images of single protein molecules, so right down to the protein level. Uh, in 1953, Watson and Crick used Rosalind Franklin's X-ray crystallography results, so that she came up with this uh, picture and they used that to discover the structure of DNA. So as you can see, the story of cell theory and what we know about cells very tightly uh, follows the advancement in technology, and in particular the technology of microscopes. As we got better microscopes, we were able to see smaller things and discover more. Uh, the lenses that we originally used for light microscopes got better and better as we got better machining techniques and better glass making techniques. The lenses became uh, giving us a higher resolution. Uh, we increased the light sources. We started off just using the sun. Uh, then we were able to use mirrors to concentrate the sun and then going into actually having oil lamps then electric lamps and now LEDs. So the light sources are getting better and better. As well as in electron microscopes, the we're not a, no longer using light. We're actually using electrons and same in X-ray uh, microscopes, which have a much higher clarity as well. The other thing that improved is the preparation of materials. The most microscopes work by shining light through the thing that you're looking at. Uh, and seeing how that light changes by going through the thing. Uh, so as we were able to cut specimens finer and finer, we are actually able to get much better resolution because you were getting down to looking at only one layer of cells as opposed to multiple layer of cells and not being able to work out what you're looking at. In this video, we've talked about spontaneous generation as an outdated theory on where life comes from. We've looked at the development of cell theory and some of the major players involved in that. We've defined cell theory, as well as looked at some of the support for cell theory and the technological advancements that have allowed us to have the understanding of cells that we do now.